Thanks for coming out this morning to our Necropoetics um, uh, panel. Our, we're going to each share some work with you and um, talk some about our engagement with the, the theme. Um, just a little reminder, uh, the, the panel is Necropoetics, Practices of Invocation, Writing with the Dead. Um, I'm Christy Maxwell, and I'll be the first presenter. I am coming today from Louisville, where I'm a, an associate professor of English. And um, my most recent book out is My My. If, if the Saturnalia table is still, is still down there, which I don't know if it is, then it might be there, if you're interested. Okay. So for the last year, I have been writing through Danish poet Inger Christensen who died in 2009, working toward ending the alphabet, an alphabet, her alphabet, written in 1981, the year of my birth, serendipitously, translated into English the same year by Susanna Nied, and published in translation 20 years later by New Directions. A book of intersecting forms Alphabet is an abecedarian poetry sequence, meaning its organization is alphabetical, that uses the Fibonacci sequence, one of the so-called languages of nature, to determine line count from section to section, which lends itself to a spiraling and expansive poetics. The intersection of linguistic and mathematical sense-making systems emphasizes the book's questions about the limits of sense as Christensen engages the senselessness of the atrocities of war and planetary destruction. Christensen's alphabet ends on section N, fittingly perhaps, given that N is for noun and for number, and is used as a variable in equations and mathematical expressions. In adherence to the Fibonacci sequence, so it's like one, one, two, three, each one's the, uh, like the, adding the two previous together, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on, her final section in should have consisted of 610 lines, but instead consists of 321. 3, 2, 1, a countdown. My work picks up at O. O as cosmic terror, as language is poor, a site of seepage, as umbilicus, site of nourishment. Writing these poems, the world keeps growing, getting bigger mostly by encouraging one, if not demanding of one, to meet more of what exists. So this idea that like expanding your lexicon somehow expands your yourself too, <laughs> um, is like something that's really growingly, um, increasingly interesting to me. They are poems against despair in this way, and they are tutoring me in a poetics of foraging, finding the poem more so than writing it. A fellowship from the American Scandinavian Foundation during my sabbatical last fall allowed me to do site-specific work in Christensen's former homes of Vila, Aarhus, and Copenhagen, immersing myself in the forests and fjords without which Christensen has said she would not be a writer. O, which I will be reading from, consists of 987 lines, as dictated by the Fibonacci sequence. These 987 lines have been divided into 20 poems, 17 of which have been written. Three 21-line poems, eight 34-line poems, six 55-line poems, two 89-line poems, and one 144-line poem links that also correspond to the Fibonacci numbers. The working title, The Rest of the Alphabet, The Alphabet's Rest, speaks to exhaustion and respite, nodding to paradox, central to poetry and to Christensen's work specifically, ricocheting as it does between concepts of resilience and devastation. I am thinking of exhaust not only as a verb, but also as a noun, signifying an engine's release of toxic emissions. But engines can also be generative, as poetic constraints, engines of composition show us. Here are a few poems. 
I'm going to read three of the poems from um, this work in progress. Opulence exists, an off-putting ostentatiousness there where froth appears to be crinoline, making ornate the off-thrown dress of an outgoing tide. There where the ocelli of a peacock's feathers appear to ogle their object of desire, without odium and without outrage or scandal, neither obligated to obey nor denounce an ever oscillating etiquette, obtrusive as our moon. That unicellular organisms exist, unicellular organisms and their organelles obtaining nutrients, unicellular organisms that affirm a notion of oneness, one like an ore dependent on another ore is one, one like a story organized without chapters, one as a one-syllable poem only orally preserved and passed on, a proliferation of oneness, one one-upping one's best idea, out of breath, out of gas, an olive branch is offered, though never detached from the olive tree, and an antagonism that might otherwise have fossilized now dissolves. Unlike the sanded septae of the ammonite, unlike the overabundant ostracod, outbreaks exist as do optimistically their containments reintroductions to notions of outside, not merely outdoors, but over there, far out, a pesky epidermis for those expecting access. As when one says world and imagines it outside oneself, the alkaline rich discharge of old faithful over time becomes less faithful, opens a mind to inquiry, leaves one to wonder over the age of ancient wood, that the comparison of isotopes exists as does the decay of isotopes and the work of cosmic rays, that oxidation exists and the dispersal of carbon dioxide, that entanglement exists, that the organ, despite its atrophy, despite its metaphorization, Eau de bouffe windows exist, ox eye windows, upper story eyes orchestrating light in otherwise lightless rooms. The sun no longer not an eye when interrupted by a cloud, once you learned of pterygium, once you saw the cloud as a growth on the conjunctiva sun, there where comparison widens, a speculum inserted and cranked the resistance of orifices to opening, the elasticity of other orifices. A single oat among oats exists within the tendency toward the plural noun, toward erasure, toward the porousness upon which osmosis depends. That an octogenarian exists alongside a 40-something, alongside a four or two-year-old, a four and two-year-old human oats. Inside the <coughs> century in which the audience has lost its taste for orcas in captivity, the splash zone long dry, just outside another October, with another page of weather turned. What is understood as a societal obligation is rejected by some actor or other, rejected already by you. On the couch, hand cradled, a phone plays a video of a boy playing with the dismembered legs of deer, making the hooves kiss, making kissing sounds to accompany the action before losing interest and in putting hooves to ground, remembering the legs by deciding to be a deer himself, a deer boy oblivious to obscenity, a boy now with furry nunchucks, 
stating what you had already guessed, who gave the deer legs to him, who took them from the deer. We learn early what parts of the world are ostensibly ours and which off limits. We look over love's shoulder and watch the web craft and catch. You sift inside the other wise, the other way you have decided to live. You have decided to live, and on loop you declare so. To live alongside the boat-shaped bracts of the oyster plant, alongside the fists of stars in the flower head of the ornamental onion, alongside the sharp mouth parts of thrips, scraping water from the petals of osteospermum. You have decided to live, and so must live alongside the will-shaped web of the orb weaver spider, alongside the horse-headed ulm. And you have learned what is felt must be learned, to express the wish, the optative, that this would be, that this would continue to be, or else that what would be would include the peridot-bearing olivine, would include the moonstone-bearing orthoclase feldspar, would offer its crust like a husband, that one might take without taking, that one might eat with, not of, that the bog's methods of preservation be extended beyond the bog, new peat replacing old peat, release, release, that the onus not fall elsewhere, that our divisions, our being separate from one another, make as much sense as Obento's corrals of nourishment, as much as an oblong with equal sides. And this is the last one that I'll um, read. Shifting as does a mantis's foamy pouch, it's Uatika from softness to hardness, careful of one's orientation, if moved, if made to feel, a sherbet of logic melted in the cup of impulse, a cold soup, edible but off-putting. This shift exists, undoes order, reorders, no debris per se, but materials othered, ousted, the oar we carry, oar-like, to change direction, to offer an alternative. Obelisks like syringes ready to sedate the stratosphere exist. Solitary obelisks missing their historic partners. Obelisks lifted out of their granite husks exist, are replicated, become attached <coughs> to power, are moved to new centers of power, are pencils secretly skywriting, perhaps, treaties against phallocentrism that go unread. The nocturnal oil bird and the night jar, cave-dwelling oil birds, preferring the oil palm's fruit, the boiled chicks of grown oil birds, the stories incubating within names, the temperatures it takes to birth and to end, an opossum skittering nightly at the base of front porch stairs, young opossum unlatched from a dead mother and transferred to a human beard, a surrogate to cling to, the possum that can lose its mother vowel, an O unuttered, to exist in silence, as silence, a potential sound overthrown like an eclipse by an overcast sky, weather an overlord, shifting Earth's tone, shifting as does a mantis's foamy pouch, its oatheca from softness to hardness, shifting like a demand curve rendered graphically, foregrounding a downsized future. The ore we mined, the extraction methods we minded, those we overlooked, an open source closed. The ore we refined, rethought, refined again in our thinking. 
orchards exist, orchards of stone fruits and palm fruits, the slippery eye getting caught up in the sudsy text and reading poem fruits. Poem fruits exist in the orchard of my mind, in the suds, in the basin of language. Overlapping tissue parading as a mass exists. Ultrasounds and imaging. Overlapping tissue one imagines parading, tossing up the baton of one's own body, and this time at least not dropping it. But really, tissue not parading at all, but filling cellular spaces, batting under cloth, internal M dashes, the ox heart tomato and the meaty ponderosas, heirlooms and mutations, disease resistant varieties, an ox heart tomato's one pound compared to an ox's heart's three or four pounds, all kinds of hearts laid open, bared, own nudist heart. Thank you. Um, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Christy. Hi, everybody. Um, I am primarily a nonfiction writer. My favorite medium of storytelling is mainly through essays. Um, and when my mother dr drowned in her dilapidated hot tub, everything changed for me, especially in my writing. My mother was complicated and hilarious. Um, and our relationship with each other was often challenging, but we were deeply connected in an incredibly unique way. And after she died unexpectedly, I got to learn so many new things about her, details that you don't share with your children. Um, and my latest work is about uncovering her secrets and handling them with care, um, with a very different perspective of who she was when she wasn't just my mama and sometimes comparing them to my own secrets. Um, over the pandemic, I took an online poetry class for fun with one of my favorite spoken word poets, Andrea Gibson. And I told them that I'd like to explore more writing, or, or, or I'd like to explore my po more poetry and my prose. And they responded to my work in such a way that set me on fire about experimenting with that. And just find, you know, finding my my style. So I, um, in 2022, I decided to set the bar pretty low, pretty low and just practice with a simple, trusty haiku every single day. And the essay I'm going to read you today has some of those tiny 575s five braided into it. Um, my name is Jenna Korsma. I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and this piece is called Pitch Black. Thank you for having me. I am standing in my shed in my backyard on a cool October day in Tucson, staring at the clear evidence that I am an imaginary, organized person. I am very good at storing memories I don't want to let go with or deal with inside of drawers, baskets, closets, sheds. I needed to go through the last of my mother's boxes. It had, all, it had been almost five years since I moved those mini coffins inside the shed. They collected dust made of grief, stained of loss. They contain her expansive history, criminal records, court documents, newspaper articles, letters from and pictures of ancestors, nothing cared for properly ever, but still intact, still tangible, still here. Artichokes grow leaves that will burst into flowers or grow hearts to eat. One box had a stack of letters, postage stamps from the 1940s through the 1960s, there were letters written by our Thaona Atham uncles from war, from travel, from life. And I kneeled before these letters and held the preserved envelopes in my hands knowing how precious they are. Each edge opened with something sharp and precise, the pages inside as delicate and crisp as a potato chip. There were black and white photos of my great grandparents in white boarding schools in the Midwest when they were young. They were all wearing matching white uniforms. Their dark faces on display had zero emotion. Steady faces, strong faces, wrong faces, and the wrong 
in the wrong places, literally stolen from their own land until their great, -grand until their great grandchildren look just like me. Colonization, two generations away from segregation. There was a notebook with my mother's handwriting inside of it that I ran my fingers over. Hi, Mama. She was an incredible writer, but she was private about it. She wrote an essay that she let me read when I was 17, and it was about a friend of hers who she had feelings for, but there were obstacles between them, and she wasn't ever able to tell him. It was titled The Weekend. And her, the way her words described her longing made me ache for that kind of connection, too. Being a muse is like being your friend without the history told. There I was in the dark shed holding the journal with her actual written words inside. What if those pages contained more essays, more of her personal experiences? What if I could honor her by telling some time in her life in her own voice? This idea feels, fills me with immense joy, I almost cry. So right there in the shed, I can't help myself. I have to read a few lines. Her handwriting is such a comfort, a gift really. I, am deep, I feel deeply close to her and so far away at the same time. My entire being is open at this moment. And at first I think this might be a love letter. We can feel a shift in our heart space that we will not like, but ignore. I realize real soon this is a dirty letter. A letter written to a lover she has either been with many times or wants to be with many times. There was no longing. There was no romance. No, this was a letter that you do not want to know that was written by your own mother in her handwriting. It was so straight and so nasty, so anatomically correct. Um, there was no room left for the imagination in this entry because every last detail was spelled out like an IKEA instruction manual. A lot of very specific Parts. <laughs> um, you sleep and I peek. There is no midnight we share, just passing in time. The next day I told a friend about it. He reminded me that one thing my mother did not deny herself was pleasure. And I thought on that notion for several days. She did not deny herself pleasure, ever. She actively fed that need until the morning she drowned in it. Her pleasure came from her lovers or throwing car keys into the desert after being stopped to search by police and then laughing so hard in their faces while she was being arrested. Some of her best stories were of her recalling the song on the radio during a police chase. She managed to find pleasure in a prison cell, in mothering me, and falling asleep with a piece of pie on a tiny plate on her chest. So much joy in the longest bubble bath and the shows she loved and the crack cocaine that pulls so sweetly through her sometimes. And picking up Lucky Wishbone for dinner, she loved being a grandmother, a mother-in-law, or bailing someone out of prison she barely knew by putting a lien on her own home to do so. Helping the outcasts, the degenerates, gave her pride. She found pleasure everywhere, especially in the darkest spaces, especially in her darkest hours. One thing she did not was deny herself pleasure. Fried shrimp and dildos. <laughs> My parents came together in their early 20s, made me and went their separate ways from each other. And at one point, I, even for a short while, my, my parents were crazy about each other. And don't we all kind of want our parents to be in love? Before the car accidents and the prison cells and the deep addiction and all the lovers, and before my half-sisters and a stepmother that rejected me, there was the two of them, young idiots making a baby they would name Jenna. In doing so, my father mostly um, passed along an unhearted heart condition to me. And the official diagnosis basically means that my heart ages faster than it should. I'm so lonely in this big, beautiful life. The door sounds like steel. I have to take a weird amount of fish oil, eat right, exercise, see a cardiologist. That's to tend to and literally care for my operational heart organ. For my emotional heart space, I often have to put deep desires that I have somewhere else that shows very little light. Pitch black sometimes. I inherited a busted heart and a filthy mind. It's mom and dad. <laughs> Pretending to hear your footsteps from room to room, hope they make me still. In 2022, I wrote 365 haikus. 
and the practice grew to be sort of an outlet, a meditative way for me to spend a few minutes each day with myself to be so careful and intentional with those thoughts. Then it became something I look forward to doing every day. Then I got kind of hot to that I do. I think about 303 chives planted for farm to bedroom. Both of my parents are dead, which is helpful when I say out loud that I resent both of them for not even pretending to care for their bodies. I resent them for not being here. But right now, I am so relieved they are gone so I can officially state that some of my haikus I've written over that year can make a way better sex letter. Fucking amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my question is, are you all ready for some softcore haiku sets? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sprinkle nice words like please in front of don't stop, just like that. Just like, yeah, breathe in my collarbone while I tie up your wrists. Smells like lavender, cedar. My instructions are crystal clear. Do what I ask. My chest cracked widely, open. Please trust me with your inside shell. I'm gonna make you taste blue, maybe. I want to be prey, pursued, hunted, sought, and caught, my hips pressed against a wall. I know you like it, the switch, but I can t turn and serve so nicely, or not. Give me what I want, take control of this now, push me on my knees now. Test that line again through your neck, through my backbone, through my teeth, through my tongue. I'll keep waiting until this fire and this wand gets put out by you. Thank you. I feel like I need a few minutes of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, y'all, I'm Kristen Nelson. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Okay. Um, so who am I? I am a, I'm pr primarily my published work is poetry, and my most recent collection is called The Length of This Gap, came out a few years ago. Um, right now I'm working on my PhD at UC Santa Cruz in um, creative critical writing in the literature department. Uh, so a recent California person via New York, via Tucson, via you know, other places you'll hear about in this writing. So um, right now I'm working on a book that's tentatively titled The Ancestor Book, and it uses stories of my ancestors and creative critical writing methodologies to flesh, enliven, elucidate the historical archives of the witch craze in early modern Europe. In my research, I trace a lineage of writers drawing from the crumbs of biographical information that we can glean from archival materials in order to humanize, revive, and understand lives that have been deemed historically unworthy of recording. Uh, I study theorists, scholars, and creative writers whose writing practices such as autoethnography, biomythography, autofiction, mestizo, mestizaje, creative nonfiction, and documentary poetics offer us tools to help flesh those archives that they're working with. So for example, Sadia Hartman and her method of critical fabulation, and M. Norvese Phillips' poetic citational practice in her 2011 book, Zong. Uh, this book that I'm writing will primarily be prose in form, but there's these poems that keep showing up in the writing too. Lyric prose poems uh, in form, where the ocean is emerging as an ancestor too, and a character, where I'm finding a way to speak with a collective utterance, that's a Sadia Hartman term, collective utterance, using I as a way to represent we. These poems have helped me to tease out one shimmering thread of truth at a time that I find in these nebulous, unruly stories of the lives of my ancestors. So today I'm sharing a selection of these poems as a way to dip in and out of my writing with and about my dead. Let's see what happens. So the names are actually um, my ancestors' names. Those are the titles tentatively right now of these pieces. I'll just read a few. So Vera DeVito, my grandmother. 
Oh, and I feel like, are we still doing trigger warnings at poetry events? Be warned. <laughs> okay. There were 1,504 murders committed in 1978 in New York City. My grandmother was the last one. She was burned to death in triple homicide. When I was around 15 until I was around 18, I burned myself with lit cigarettes. It was the most painful way I could think of to punish myself for eating food, for feeling too much, for leaving my body for too long. I held the cigarette to the inside of my arm long enough to cause my skin to burn to black, that tiny bit of fire. It took approximately 30 seconds of a concentrated force, count to 30. Fire is more painful than violent sex. Fire is more painful than being beaten with a table leg. Fire is more painful than a painting falling off the wall. <laughs> Fire is more painful than back surgery. Fire is more painful than having a bone broken in your hand. But oh, the relief when it stops burning. The moment between pain and ache is a perfect nothing. I'm deciding whether or not to watch a video of a man being burned alive by ISIS. This is social media post September 11th. We have access to these videos now. I believe someone believed that he was gay. Snuff film, murder, murder porn. I don't know if the images will ever leave my body. I'm not sure I can handle it. But how else will I know what my grandmother experienced? Sandy Nelson Daniels, my sister. Sister, what set the swallows to soaring in summer streets back home? Did our father ever open a hydrant for play? Some streets set to shimmering at sunset like the sea. Those swallows would be singing streamers of silver turned snow a few months later. But for now, you in your bathing suit, sunlit sky, the snap of the cap, and then streets filled with sweetness. Sister, was it always simple to pull, see, and say your smiles? I would say such and such, and your splendid stallion of a smile surrounded us all. At play, your smile was the only sword needed to free us slaves to the ghosts in the graveyard at the wide rock at the end of the driveway. Base. Such a singularly joyful and suspect society we kids built having no sense of slavery nor stock. We gathered at sunset with our simple secrets, and you shepherded all of us. The savages like me with stained t-shirts and picked at scabs at our knees, and the sophisticates who kept bows in their hair and carried little purses. We all look to you. I would say something stupid and you would smile and suddenly I wasn't stupid. My sister, my Wendy, who was your shepherd? Who was your Wendy back when you were Peter? Sister, as you grew, your suit turned triangle, shrunk. When did the streets become sources for strikes instead of smiles for you? I was 12 and you were gone. Suddenly the hood was full of strangers, the same ice cream truck, the same ice cream guy, the same jingling tune, but the sweetness soared. He offered more than sweet souffles, invited me in, admired my legs, reached out his hands. I was 12 and you were gone and the streets were full of men, all soldiers who struck out with their secrets about sex, I wish I could say I stayed with those invisible souls at the wide rock at the end of the drive. But summer splendor swells and ebbs, and girls fall under the successful slaughter of men. I left that truck small. I was small and sticky. It was the start of my smalling. You taught me to shine my smile and speak sweet. He taught me to sit and quiet my speak. 
I did not see. Did anyone see? Slowly, I stopped looking south for you. There was silence about how you got gone. I looked for a signal. I listened for sounds. But then I had a girlfriend, and then I had a boyfriend. I stopped asking about my slender sister somewhere hiding. I turned sober-faced. I could stroke a penis and soothe a pussy by the very next summer. What was your starting? Time spacious seeps in. I found myself standing in a secondhand store holding a fringed black leather jacket that could have been yours. I was sitting and counting. Four years? Five? Six? Time sits and shuts for me. I am always still standing and counting. I have no sense of it. Let's say several years had gone by. I found an address and put some sunlight on the page. Say, sister, sometimes. I picked up a scream and spoke about sores in our hearts and put it on the page and sent it to Alabama. And then I sat. Did your smile rise when you got my letter with that photo, me in a stupid blue square hat on top of tamed curls? Then I could drive. I would drive some miles and drive some miles and learn my scholar's skills, then drive some miles and drive some miles under big, swampy skies to get to your door. What did you tell your kids about me before I arrived, an absent auntie? To see you see me again. I was sickened. I sat in front of your door for a time like a specter to your life, shocked that you were just there inside. I could hear a vacuum. You, my superior something, me, single and small. How did you always have sunlight across your brow? I could not be strict with your kids and they saw it. Their spoken twangs versus our hard edges. Did you like hearing South on their tiny tongues? For a few years, I was seen by you, sister. We would sit in your trailer and you again, my source of splendor. I would tell you about my science study. I loved your husband, he was kind. Your kids were my summer sunlight now in their tiny suits under streaks of water. Did you feel the slime slinking inside? See, sometimes your sister dies. The street seems straight, but streets seem like a lot of things in summer sunlight. A few more short ones. This one is Filomino de Francesco Cucciarelli, my great grandmother. Great grandmother, one of the pups died. I was having such a good day, you know, I slept well. I did some writing, it was sunny and warm enough for a tank top. Sun on my skin and the violent femmes in my ears. When I arrived to visit my seals, I saw that one of the babies was dead. Its flaccid little body among the kelp being eaten by ravens. The day before, I saw the same pup rejected by all of the mamas, all of the aunties. It was begging for food, begging for comfort, but they all rejected it, hissed it away. The next day it was dead. The other pups have gained weight, are fuzzy and speckled white all over. Today I visited again and the dead pup was feeding a vulture. Today a mama seal was sniffing all of the babies and being shooed away by the other mamas and aunties. She seemed forlorn and I wondered, did she lose her pup? Did she wander too far and leave it too long and now it's dead? Great grandmother, you lost babies. You crossed the sea and must have seen whales, sharks, dolphins, seals, rays, and flying fish. Were you scared? I always lean in closer and I wonder, did I get that from you? Your daughter, Maria Giuseppe, my grandmother, was not fond of the outdoors. You raised a city girl in the Bronx, and though she enjoyed looking at the ocean, I never saw her, saw her step foot in it, not once. But you were raised in the country. You must have traveled to Naples a few times to see the sea, at least a few times before you boarded the ship. It would have taken you about six weeks on that ship, puking and rocking and leaning in, 
Did you lean in? Right whales, humpbacks, blues, great whites, tigers, lemons. Did you lean in? Written with my eyes closed. She lives in a beautiful place with enough food to eat. Her clothes are homespun. She works all the time. Perhaps she is bored. Perhaps she longs to cross the sea because of a kind of calling, because of a kind of knowing that is deeper than I understand. Stay in it. She is in this town where there is a temple to Isis and there are walnut trees. It has been years now since witches were burned. It has been at least 50 years since a burning, but her mother would remember them. Her grandmother would have seen them. Philomena, did you worry about the burnings? Did they haunt you like they haunt me? Did they make you scream out in the night like my grandmother screamed out for you on her deathbed? Mama, mama, she longed to return to you since you left her there in the Bronx. With all of those brothers, with that horrible man who fathered her, what did you appreciate about your life? Did you do it for her, my grandma, your daughter? She wasn't even born then. What drove you across that sea? This is the last set. Maria Gracia Tomicello Paolo, my other great grandmother. Over the years, I have stored your dowry linens in a cedar chest, in a cloth bag, in a plastic storage bin, and in a wicker basket. I have almost never touched them. I can remember three times that I unfolded them. Now I keep them stashed in a white garbage bag inside of a cloth box, inside of a hanging shelf, inside of my closet. I'm afraid my cats will get hair on them, afraid my dirty hands will stain them, that delicate lace, those pure white linens. I am afraid of what they represent. I am afraid of my desire to soak them in my menstrual blood, fling them into the landscape, put them on top of my bed and let the cats scratch away. Maria Gracia, your son Louis would sing to me. He would make up little songs asking me to wait to poop until my mama came home. <laughs> he would rock me and he loved me. Your son Louis was a quiet man with beautiful skin. After he broke his leg in three places, he walked with a bow-legged limp. He carried my school photograph in his wallet, not his daughter's not the other grandkids, just mine. I carried a poem he cut out of the New York Post for me when I asked him to. On the back was his half-finished crossword puzzle. We had a secret language, a language of head nods and gestures, the language of men, but with a little more tenderness. Until the day he died, with a full belly, in bed, at home, surrounded by people who loved him. He wasn't perfect. He turned to drink for a time like his father, but I want you to know how much he was loved, that he and his wife built a good life for themselves and for them da their daughters and grandchildren. When I was an undergrad, I studied marine science. Once on a beach near Tampa, my roommate and I snorkeled out to a pod of 200 dolphins. I know we weren't supposed to do that, but they were just offshore, and there we were with our fins, masts, and snorkels on the sand. Nothing would have stopped me that day. What I remember most was the strength of my own body carrying me over the breakers and then being surrounded by eyes. There were so many eyes looking at me. I lost the other human, and it was just me and the dolphins and all the rest of the creatures together in a big, wide ocean. I stayed still and heard their echolocation searching me out. None of them got close enough to touch me, but they kept looking. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you to the festival. Like this is such an excellent event in such an excellent city. I'm so happy to be here. Um, thank you, Christy Maxwell, for organizing the panel. I'm really looking forward to being in conversation with you. To Kristen Nelson for inviting me to join this panel and for being an inspiring and generous friend. To Jenna Corsmo, a new friend I'm so glad to meet and read with. And um, to all of you who are here, thanks for coming. So the dead I have been writing with are the dead of the cemetery. Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland was my home cemetery, a place I've taken hundreds of walks in, held reading groups in, gone on dates in, met friends in, and you know, on and on for almost 20 years before I moved a year and a half ago to Santa Cruz um, for the Creative Critical Literature PhD program there. I'm now working on what looks like two books, uh, one in prose and one in poetry, and my sort of introductory comments are sort of some critical context um, for the prose, and then the poems I'm still figuring out, so I'll just read those and, um, and in the way that reading poetry aloud in a room with other people listening can like reveal things to you about your work. Um, so thanks in advance for letting me do that. My first working thought was that cemeteries were visual reminders of the shared reality of death. In terms of social struggle, the solidarity that the mass of the exploited classes, and as a person who must sell my labor to survive, I am among that group, shares against the exploiting class. Toby Altman said yesterday, I put you in my comments. Uh, who, and I don't know Toby. Um, I just was at the, at the um, Allegories of Infrastructure panel yesterday. Toby Altman said yesterday about buildings built in the Bauhaus style that they were reminders that other org organizations of social life are possible. Um, this reminder of historical solidarity in the cemetery is necessary because of the driving neoliberal pressure to identify vertically with folks who have made it, where making it always means getting rich. Uh, other aspects, as I began to write um, and think more uh, directly about the cemetery, other aspects began to become visible. Cemeteries are places to do nothing, which under capitalism is itself a sort of mirror of death since Capitalism requires circulation and growth. There's nothing to do in a cemetery except non-productive in the capitalist sense, things like sit by a grave, grieve, stare at the sky, read tarot with a friend. Cemeteries are an increasingly rare example also of public space, uh, typically free for the living, uh, and there's nothing to buy once you're there. Again, for the living. Uh, so that's a whole thing, yeah. There's, they're really complicated spaces. Cemeteries are spaces that both reproduce and defy oppressive structures. The cemetery is a racially and socioeconomically segregated space, as well as a relationally entangled one. Um, that is, the cemetery is a social space. So. This work is about seeing in the cemetery a, a kind of social space that is both reflective of and set apart from uh, the dominant tempos, spatial arrangements, and material compositions of the present. I see in the historiography and art made in and about the cemetery possibilities for an orientation to the social that makes visible the deep entanglement across identity formations that can be taken up as solidarity. One of my theoretical guides is the cultural theorist Walter Benjamin, who died while attempting to escape Nazi-occupied France in 1940. Central to Benjamin's materialist philosophy of history was that history is neither linear nor fixed. It always holds out for the oppressed classes possibilities for struggle and reclamation by a fragments that become visible at particular moments of relevance, often coincident with moments of danger. In becoming visible, these fragments allow struggling people to see possibilities for changing the present, and they release energy for doing so. And having taken a cemetery tour with some of the people here, uh, with, with the amazing tour guide Bloody Mary here in this city, um, I know there is energy in the cemetery, uh, especially um, uh, it became particularly pronounced on this, on this tour that we took a couple of days ago in the potter's field, the burial ground for people who don't have the money to buy those you know, ridiculously expensive burial plots and instead make their own grave markers and memorials out of the materials to hand, um, uh, so often personal to the dead and their loved ones. Photos, toys, musical instruments, bottles of booze, PVC piping, inexpensive cement. The cemetery as a site of such fragments, and cemeteries are so filled with fragments, um, 
is profound given that so many of the interlocking crises of the 21st century are rooted in premature death of species, of ecosystems, um, via global racial capitalism and its products, such as pandemic, extraction, state-sponsored and extrajudicial violence, despair-induced addiction, and I could you know, keep naming forms of death. At the same time, Benjamin believed, as I do, that we have an obligation to attempt to fulfill the foreclosed struggles of those dead who fought for or just wanted a more just world before us. And I have this June Jordan quote that's a little too long to read, but just where she just names the kind of what she means by a just world, which is like a safe and reliable subway system, an attractive <laughs> apartment that I can afford to rent, a clean and welcoming community laundromat, a local and an inexpensive crowded restaurant. Like this is, um, you know, it's really, it's really basic in a way. Um, although not to get to it given the circumstances of it. So that's those are some of the things I've been thinking about. And um, so I'll just read a few poems um, from this kind of growing, growing collection. Um, I have a little kind of um, a little tiny poem I call an intro. It, which is like the the religious in some religious context, just like the the ceremonial opening um, to help us drop in. Maybe. Sticky body, silk slicks on skin, sooty city. Dawn punky, peachy alley with my gowdy. Drawn dress, pressed dress, wet dress. Dots on dots on diamonds. Cream on mint on black on blush. Rust or umber in there somewhere. I've never been here, but the heat blurs the border between my body and the city. Um, this is, so I've been, I've been getting some money to go around and um, write in different cemeteries around the world after I decided to expand from Mountain View. And I went last summer to Paris and went to some of the cemeteries there. So this is from Montparnasse. Sunbright spots, light bouncing off a million shiny flats, mica, quartz, crystal, schist, embedded in rows upon rows of tombstones and tombs, deep range of grays, of greens of trees and leaves and greens on graves. I keep changing glasses to see among the shades. There's a laminated map that hangs from a string on a hook at the entrance. Entranced, the purple black lilies we brought, dense and delicate, holding both. These things are made to be of use, and the grave seekers, turning the placemat map in hand, help each other find their dead their seat at that table. Remember that you are dust. We find Baudelaire in two places. There is his marble cenotaph, prominent at the head of a wide path, towering bust on a plinth, great chin in hand. Charles Angel glowers above a supine stone corpse. And here is his grave, deep in the rows among the others. He is with his stepfather, his mother, his father, named, not set apart, layered in relation, as above, so below. De la, and then this little quote from Baudelaire, de la vaporisation et de la centralisation du moi, tout est là, that is all. The, the, the vaporization and the centralization. I, I, walk, I walk and have thoughts, then they dissipate when I sit. I'm haunted by a criticism of Baldwin that I read last night in the failing New York Times, that he was too much an idealist to be a great novelist, couldn't give himself fully to ambivalent complexity. Well, fuck that. How many writers make me gasp for breath and life is in keep reading? Ronaldo said, touched enough by the work to take it in as a familiar being. Yes, complexity, but principles are simple. All who desire shelter, they shall have it. You work from that. Um, in the churchyard at St. Oswald's Grasmere, the burial place of William and Dorothy Wordsworth, which isn't really why I went there, but it had 
and ended up, they were there. <laughs> there were, and, I, and I, it was productive. There are berries everywhere in England. Berries in the trees, flower fairies of the autumn, Tom Bombadil and Goldberry. But Turkish delight is what the evil witch gives to the wayward English boy whose repentance and return to the good fold of those intended to rule forms the core of the story. This is killing me. My ancestral and cultural heritage here in this former empire, hound dogs, hunting horns, and stone cottages, move my heart. But what gives? Dry stone walls, well made, stand tall, but to tell tale of common land cut up into property. William planted these yew trees in the churchyard. They are thick trunked and lush for a needled tree, bright with red berries, or in proper terms, arrows. Think of the pomegranates, jeweled seeds. This yew beneath which I sit, a kind of underworld visit, would like a rhyme. You, who, listen a while. Sun streams on the spare stones, green lawn glows, Tourists come, no one knows anything. People bumble, follow the arrow to the famous grave. I feel angry at William for leaving, retreating to the lakes when the French Revolution overwhelmed him. Best turn inward, thought he, away from the wider world. And for not being a poet that moves me more. Well, I wonder as I wander without my phone, lonely as a cloud in the vestiges of empire, and at empire itself, pursuit of power over others, entitled to take so much death. You branch reaches over the headstones, gentle giant, and the grave markers also are large, an uncanny scale for this small yard. The stones are big, person height, but wafer-like, spectral, I guess, slim stones for Slim stones for a thin place. The U moves slow and slight. What's a word for rustle without sound? Quiet in the morning air as summer turns to fall. A kind of atmospheric respiration. The tree breathes with the people come to ground. And I think I was going to read one more, but are we? Oh no, actually, that's all I was going to read. Thank you. has anything, comment, or um, question, or um, anything that you want to contribute to, <laughs> to, to our panel? <laughs> I noticed that there were visual, there's something, there were like images on the pages. You were oh, yeah, I put some, I took a lot of photos okay. and I was playing around with putting, um, putting little images in, in there. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't show them. I was like, yeah. I'm not going to try to show them, but there are little, little tiny things. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Are you going to make it all the way to Z? If I live long enough. <laughs> 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 you're really like, in it for your duration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hope I can make it to Z, but I also hope that if I don't live long enough to make it to Z, someone else will pick yeah. up the project. Yeah. So it's kind of like oh, an that's cool. interesting yeah. thing to like project into the <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of lines by the time it's finished. I don't know. I know. That's why I was like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for, yeah. for coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.